judgment about the failure of the application of the treaty. And if the treaty has not been applied, this is mainly the responsibility of the European Commission and the responsibility of certain member states. Let this be remembered. France has never uh, paid tribute to the Stability Pact, neither in primary law nor in secondary law. France's policy has shown one continuity, sabotaging the Stability and the Growth Pact, because the uh, oligarchy governing France by Paris is of the opinion, uh, without having been ever sanctioned by the French people, that France is more sovereign than other countries, and that um, the rule of law does apply to others, but not to them. So what is the situation today? The situation is that the habitual and regular and unsanctioned violation of the Stability and Growth Pact has paved the ground for saying that in the um, course of the financial and economic crisis, uh, and I hear this could give you quotations from several French politicians that exceptional circumstances, uh, crisis situation, um, request exceptional measures, and that we cannot bother with the legal rules. This is an understanding which I do not share at all, because if ever you break rules, this paves the road, the, the road for a, an implosion of the European community as such, which is considered uh, on the whole as a Rechtsgemeinschaft, as a legal community. Um, and the legal community is a community where law defines rules. So the, st the Stability Pact has been not only violated by the Member States, it has been not applied by the European Commission. Uh, there has been one very, very important ruling by the European Court of Justice which reminds the community of the imperative necessity of applying strict to the stability and, and growth pay, which the Commission has never done, <coughs> and where the Commission has failed. This was political failure, administrative failure. Then the Commission decided to flexibilize the, the stability and growth pay in order to um, pave the way for a more subtle application, which is only uh, another phrasing for not applying um, the stability and growth pact, or applying it in a political way, in a discretionary way. And this is the contrary of what Europe and the European Monetary Union needs. Instead of strict, uh, not sturdy, but strict application of rules, flexible um, uh, uh, application, which means non-application to rules according to political motives. The Co European Commission has itself turned very much into the role of a government not any longer becoming or remaining an, an administration. The violation of the no bailout clause by bilateral agreements helping Greece is the most flagrant um, proof that the European Commission and certain member states help each other in a collusive attempt to breach the fundamental rule of Article 125 of the, the treaty organizing the functioning of the European Union. The no bailout clause is a legal interdiction which does not only prevent the community from financial assistance to states um, who are failing, but which presents, prevents and interdicts governments to um, give guarantees or any financial uh, assistance at all. It is a rule to make sure that the different sovereign debtors are adequately priced on the market, and it is a rule which should make sure that the market is the arbitrator of the price every government has to pay in order to raise funds for public finance. If you suspend that rule, sooner or later there will be enormous distortion of competition on the capital markets. And, uh, the fact that this uh, distortion of competition on capital markets um, is even enhanced by the purchase of bonds by the European Central Bank is not an arg argument not to apply uh, the, the, the new bailout clause. Then we, we come to the violation of the monetary financing of the budget through the ECB. What we see here is the most scandalous non-application or flexibilization of European monetary policy. 
The European Central Bank practices an open market policy which is no longer uh, or can no longer be arranged under monetary policy, but which is primarily fiscally minded. It intervenes on the market in order to help sovereign debtors. At the beginning of this week, when it was difficult for Portugal to raise funds and when uh, um, Portuguese um, um, bonds were trading uh, with great difficulty, again, the European Central Bank intervened. Monsieur Trichet's claim is that he fully respects the European treaty because he only intervenes on the secondary market. For the time being, this is true, but this legal conclusion is far-fetched and totally imprecise. Not only the intervention on the secondary market um, can have an inflationary effect uh, if the intervention takes dimensions uh, as we are now witnessing, uh, but apart from that, um, um, the, the intervention on the, on the secondary market is done primarily for fiscal motives. Uh, open market policy, that is to say intervention by the central bank on the secondary market, is allowed under open market policy in order to do a, a, a fine adjustment or fine tuning of monetary policy. But the motives of the central bank, it, of the European central bank, are fiscal helping sovereign debtors, making the market work. So we have quite, quite clearly here a breach of Article 123, and the question which we have to raise later in our discussion, Peter, my, ladies and gentlemen, is how the European Court of Justice could limit, finally, the outrageous behaviour of the European Central Bank. If there are no limits to purchasing sovereign bonds, then, sooner or later, um, the work of the European Central Bank as a, a fire brigade for failing states will uh, make the European Central Bank become, uh, if not insolvent, but at least failing. The capital increase from 5 billion to 10 billion, in view of purchases of about 100 billion, uh, shows the risk exposure of the European Central Bank. Apart from that, I'm quite sure that you're fully aware uh, of the policy of qualitative easing, which has been, um, so to speak, <coughs> in order to put it in polite terms, a great privilege for the Greek, uh, Spanish and uh, Irish banks. And the policy of uh, qualitative easing, that is to say, accepting collaterals uh, which are of less quality, has led to a, um, an artificial maintenance of the Irish banking financial system. There again, the role of the European Central Bank deserves severe criticism and um, I challenge not only its policy, but I challenge the legality of its action and the leadership of Mr. Trichet. Mr. Trichet is not only um, um, uh, queuing up for his own succession, but if that goes on, he will leave the European Central Bank with a bark of bad debt and the European Central Bank will remain nothing but a bad bank. <clears throat> we have to conclude that for the time being, um, our impression is that um, the um, regular unsanctioned violation of um, cardinal rules, pillars, of the European normative pillars of the European Monetary Union um, are only the expression of a concept of the European Monetary Union which I would least, at least call or qualify as uh, incomplete. Um, when the European Monetary Union, um, which uh, as a matter of fact I have principally supported, not with 11 starting members, but with a smaller core of, uh, of uh, founding members. When it started, we uh, simply defined the um, aptitude to become a member of the Union through so-called convergent criteria, convergence criteria. We looked at uh, the budget deficits, we looked at uh, the gross uh, debt, uh, we looked at price and, uh, at inflation rate, but we did not look sufficiently at two factors, the competitiveness of the economy reflected in the 
balance of payment. Um, uh, in the balance of payment. So, as a matter of fact, a country like Portugal, 